Hello everybody. Today's video, we're going to be taking a look at the G3000 Suite. This is a glass cockpit system for this amazing TBM 930 turboprop aircraft. So first things first, uh, we're going to go ahead and take a quick brief little look at the functionality. We're going to fly a flight. Uh, today we're coming out of Orlando Executive Airport and we're going to be flying over to Cape Canaveral and going ahead and doing a landing. To mix things up for us, of course, uh, we're going to use the entire flight plan built inside of the simulator here as opposed to with the flight plan builder. I know there's one that's already there, but we'll actually go ahead and created ourselves as well. You're also going to get a chance to see some of the kind of, I don't want to call it hidden functionality, but it's not might be where you expected it to be kind of technology. So first things first, let's go ahead and take a look at where we're going today. So this is the website skyvector.com in case you're not familiar with it. It is awesome. We're going to be taking off from here. We're going to be intercepting. There's actually a VOR station here. Feel free to look that one up if you're new to VOR. It's basically a radio navigation system. We're then going to take that radio radial from the VOR station and then fly all the way over here and land the aircraft. So that's a pretty straightforward thing. What I do want to do though is I'm going to get the number for the VOR and that's going to be 112.20. Well, I got to remember that value. Okay, let's start getting set up. So first things first, I want to go ahead and set myself up with that particular VOR station so it's ready to go. Right now, we're actually slaved into the FMS system. If we want to change that, we just go to where it says Active Nab, and you can press that. Right now, I've got VOR1 selected. Of course, what is it selected to? 1110.50, which isn't going to do us much good. We need this to be the VOR station that we just talked about a moment ago. So how do you get to VOR? Well, this is a bit of a process, unfortunately. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to come down to this little touchpad here. Click on Navcom, and now you notice there's nothing here about VOR. There isn't. This is basic communication as well as your transponder. So what you're going to have to do is actually come over here, and you're going to see the thing that says audio and radios. Left click on that, and now you have access to your VOR stations. You can actually scroll down if you want, and even have ADF in here, which I think is amazing. Yes, you can get ADF on this aircraft. So anyway, I'm going to come here. I'm going to left click right here. It's going to pop up what frequency I'm going to turn to. If you remember, we said it was 112.20. Let's go ahead and press the enter key. And now you'll notice that it's in the standby, but we actually want it to go ahead and get into the active. We know it's in standby still because this number is still the same number as this. So I'm going to press and hold this for a second. You let go, and it should swap the two frequencies over if you hold it down long enough, of course. There it goes. Look at that. You also notice that this needle immediately went flying, and we also got some DME information. It actually tells us we're very darn close to where we need to be, which makes sense because that VOR station is actually at the airport. So now you can see we can go ahead and set our course. So what is our course going to be in this particular case? Well, doing the math really, really quick and actually checking over on Sky Vector, it comes out to be one zero three. So I'm going to go up to my course one knob. I'll go ahead and recenter real quick, make my life a little bit simpler. And we're going to scoot suit all the way over to one zero three. Yes, that needle just went flying. So what does this mean to us? Well, let's take a look. If we were to take off right now, we're trying to get here, but we're using a radio station to actually represent this. So this is actually not where it's going to be. We can tell that we're facing in the opposite direction of where we need to be ultimately, and that we're slightly off to the right of where we're going to need to be. So when we take off, we're basically going to be taking ourselves a really, really long left turn, and then coming around and intercepting this moments later. Of course, we could try to cut this very, very aggressively, like with a right turn, but again, that's going to be kind of awkward for us to go ahead and execute. So that's pretty easy to do. Next thing I want to do is I'm going to go over to my heading hold. I'm actually just going to push the button in so it lines up with runway heading. It just simplifies things as far as kind of what I need to think I need to do. Coming over here, uh, we'll go ahead and set up our altitude. For this particular flight, we're going to be traveling at 3,500 feet. Perfect. Now what we want to do is tell the system how we want to get to 3,500 feet. In this case, I'm going to be using my flight level change mode. And you can actually come over here like this and just squeak in the exact flight level speed that you want to. We're actually going to be using a cruise climb today of about 150 knots. That is going to be a very fast climb and it's going to get us up there sooner. There's a new button on this autopilot which you may not be familiar with. This is YD. That says yaw damper. Basically what that does is it's going to stop the aircraft from jerking left and right if we run its turbulence, which in uh, today's weather we're probably going to get quite a bit of. So I'm going to turn that on. Obviously, don't turn the automatic pilot on. I'm going to come over here for the nav hold button. I'm going to turn that one on as well. Now, note that the automatic pilot is not 
on at this time. The flight director certainly is. You can tell by that little pink line like we had on the G1000. Basically, I'm going to fly the first part, and then I'm going to let the autopilot kind of take care of the rest of it for me, keeping things relatively simple. So now that this is all set up, this is all set up, this is all set up. Now, a moment ago, I was mentioning the fact that you can control all your communications down here. So for example, if you were to bring up the ATC page, you could see that I'm currently on 118.70. You know, if I wanted to change this to another frequency, I could just click here, dial in the new frequency, like for example, uh, I'll say 12500, enter, and it would actually flip to that new frequency. So if I want to go back to the other one, I could just hit transfer again, and now I'm back on the main frequency. I'm actually going to flip to that one. So this is a handy dandy feature here. So what else can we do? Well, we're going to get airborne first, and then we're going to take a look at some of the other features that we have at our disposal. One thing I am going to do is shut up the inertial separator. Don't need that for today. All right, looking pretty good, looking pretty good. It's actually a little cold outside. Give myself a little bit of temperature. I think that's a little bit too much. Yes, an air conditioning on an airplane. What a novelty. All right, let's get rolling. I'm going to make sure the parking brake is disengaged. I'm going to go ahead and give it almost mostly full power. And we're going to get pulled right off the runway because this is a very powerful turboprop. And one about 100% power if I can get it. Oop, too much. Yeah, that's pretty good right about there. Lovely. All right, rotate speed in this particular aircraft is 90 knots. There it is. Give it a tug. And we are in the air like nothing. Landing gears up. Flaps are going to be going up in a moment. Now, it's considered bad form to start turning your aircraft before you clear the end of the runway. So it's a good idea to kind of, you know, take your time to go ahead and make sure you get a good decent climb before things get crazy. Notice how fast this aircraft accelerates. It is unbelievable. All right, we're clear of the runway. Let's go ahead and execute that nice left turn. All right, we're pulling back just a bit too much here. Remember, we want to be climbing at about 150 knots. That's looking like a pretty good turn. This is a pretty aggressive turn for having just taken off, but we're moving. Okay, everybody go ahead and take a look right down at the bottom where you can see the little green line. This is VOR1 on it. Now remember, we're getting that information to operate that VOR directly from a radio station. We're not getting that from our GPS. So what's going to happen is when I get very, very close to where I need to be, again, VOR is a much more advanced topic. I just wanted to show you how you could use it. It's going to immediately swing from left to right. Again, automatic pilot is not on at this time. I'm basically going to do my own little thing here. There it goes. Go ahead and start correcting. Now, you probably wonder why the flight director just dropped off the bottom of the earth. The reason is, is we're almost up to 3,500 feet. All right, starts flashing at you to let you know that you're almost your altitude. We're going to gently start pushing the controls down. I think I'm going to overshoot it a little bit, but I'm still getting the hang of just how sensitive the controls are in this particular version of Flight Simulator. All right, we're going to start picking up quite a bit of speed here. Push down gently, gently, trying to get used to the trim. That nice electric trim is always very fast compared to the old school trim. All right, you can see that green line is starting to recenter now, telling me I'm only slightly off course, and I'm slightly off course to the left. Down just a little bit more. Beautiful. Let's go ahead and swing the other way. Picking up a lot of speed here. And notice that the GPS course is not coincident with the VOR station course. They're two different courses. That looks pretty good. I'm actually going to go ahead and reach over and press the automatic pilot button. Now, since we set everything up on the ground, we're pretty much ready to go. And now we can start taking a look at some of the other features of this particular system. So right now, the automatic pilot is going to try to center this line as best as it can. And again, VOR is a relatively advanced topic. I just want to kind of show you the two side by side. All right, let's take a look at some of the other buttons that you have on this display. So first things first, you're pretty comfortable with all the stuff that's on here. If you needed to change your active nav, you can press here. If you need to go ahead and change your range, you could come over here. All the rest of the options, unfortunately, are just for your own sense of humor. But the good news is a lot of them you can still control. Let's go back down to this touchpad. 
pressing PFD Home, this is going to give us the ability to set our navigation source. In this case, Nav1 is a VOR1. We can also turn on bearings. For example, I could set this to be the ADF bearing. We don't have an ADF st station tuned that we can actually get right now, so it doesn't do us much. We could actually set it to Nav1, and you'll actually see how far away we are from that radio station that we were just typing into right now. This is, again, very similar to what you have on the G1000. You also have the ability to select specific speed bugs. Now a speed bug is going to be a little line you get on here. For example, when we go to land this aircraft in a little while, we can actually set the V app, which is going to be our approach speed. And you'll see a little blue line a little later on when we're coming into a landing. You could also come here and actually change it if you needed to as well. You know, I could set 85, for example, enter, and it will go ahead and remember that later on. Again, that's a super cool feature that a lot of older systems did not have you be able to change easily. Other options you have, of course, is you have everybody's favorite timers. This is a pretty straightforward timer, only it's a little easier to use. I simply click here. You go ahead and type in the time. For example, if I wanted two minutes, and then you press enter, and now you can choose whether to count up or count down, start. Now, the nice thing is that timer is now displayed right over here on the right. Again, this is more for your instrument pilots who are flying things like holds and need a little bit of extra help to go ahead and make sure their timing is correct. You can always use the clock, too, if you need to. Going back to the PFD, we have a couple of the settings. We have minimums. And again, this is for instrument pilots. We can go ahead and set it to the standard 200 feet if we wanted to, and we could leave that alone. And then finally, you have PFD settings, which is just kind of little customizable pieces. You have AOA, which is this little thing right here. If you shut that off, Boop, it goes away. If you turn it back on, it comes back. Now, the nice thing is you could set this to auto, and the theory there is it's not supposed to come out unless you're in situations when you need it to come out. In my case, I leave it on. You have the wind display, three different options. Your first option is going to show you current crosswind, which is an awesome feature because basically this will tell you how much the wind is pushing you. In this case, the wind is pushing us three knots to the left, and it's pushing us one knot from behind. So the wind, I would say, is basically coming from right around here. It's a really, really easy way to see what the wind is. Personally, for me, I like to go ahead and set it to option three because it's going to give me the direction as well as the speed when I need to do things like, you know, pick up what runway I want to land on or something along those lines. So you can also set your comm spacing. I never feel the need to do this, especially since you can dial things in directly, but it is there in case you need it. So that's it for the PFD settings. Let's take a look at the MFD settings. All right, now it gets complicated. So if I just clicked on map settings, nothing would happen. If I click on weather, you actually turn on the weather display on this big screen here. Now notice, if you want to control the actual range, you have to use this knob here. Simply hold your mouse over it and wheel back and forth. You can see I've got quite a bit of interesting weather looking up ahead. Now if you were to press that again, you can actually switch to the weather radar. In this particular case, you have this one, which is a horizontal weather display. We can see we have something nasty over there on the left. I don't know what they're talking about, but okay. And we can also see that we can switch it to vertical mode, so you can see what the weather looks like vertically as well. Again, this is a really, really handy feature if you're trying to avoid nasty storms. To get out of that mode, you just go back to next red. Actually, you can go back to back. Go to weather select. Oh, sorry. My bad. Go back to the map option. Sorry. And you're good to go in this case. We have a couple other features down here as well. We have a direct to option, which allows you to literally type in where you'd like to go. So for example, if I want to go ahead and uh, select waypoint, I can go ahead and dial in where we're going directly and actually travel to there immediately. So for example, I could go KXMR, enter, and press activate enter. And you can see it gave me a new little piece that I can actually use to get to my destination. In this case, I'm actually going to use that. All right, beautiful. So now we're navigating towards that new point that I just selected. You also have the option to do flight planning, and this is super duper cool because you can click here to set your origin. So for example, let's say we actually started at MCO. Come in here like this, dial it in, press the enter key, and then you could go ahead and change your destination as well. Notice when I did this, it deleted everything. So you have to be very, very, very cautious about that. So I could say KXMR, which is our destination, enter. And of course, I could add an en route waypoint. If you remember, we used O R L. Uh, which one's closer? That looks good. Bam! And you're able to build your entire flight plan just from that little display changing options. Keep in mind, when you're done with your flight plan, you can go back up to the MFD page. You also have things like PROC, which is your procedures. In this case, if I wanted to, I could go ahead and pick a procedure that I appreciated. In this case, I would prefer to have RNAV1 the tree, but tree 1 works pretty well too. And again, this is exactly the same to those of you who are familiar with other navigation systems like this. We also have speed bugs, which you've seen. 
Waypoint Info, which unfortunately only provides us with airport information. If we go to this page, we can now click Select Airport, and you can go ahead and type in anything you want. So in this case, we'll do MCO again, just for fun. And you can see all the usual details. It even tells you how far away it is. And you can even do things like getting the frequencies. You can even get the runways. It gives you a lot of control as far as being able to research things. The real unit, by the way, will actually have almost every different kind of option you can look at for waypoints. You can even put your own waypoints in. Last but not least, you have the nearest page. If you click this one, you can go ahead and find the nearest things. In this case, I can see that there is a NDB station at bearing 9 or 9, and its frequency is tree one tree. Now, if we wanted to enter that into our radio, we can click Navcom, Audio and Radios, scroll down, and you can see I have my ADF right down here. So I could just say that one, boop, transfer, and now we've gone ahead and swapped to that ADF station that quickly and that easily. You can see we're getting a little off course here. Why? Because navigation mode got shut off the moment we switched what type of active nav we are. You do remember that, right? On the flip side, this actually makes my life a little bit simpler because now all I have to do to land is basically line myself up perpendicular, I should say parallel, to where I was just a moment ago. We have to actually start descending. So I'm going to go ahead and select myself a new altitude of 1,000 feet. I'm going to select vertical speed mode. I'm going to go ahead and get myself 1,000 feet per minute, reduce my throttle. And that's exactly the heading I like to travel on, heading hold mode on. Beautiful. Oh, we can actually look out the window now. Hey, look at that. It wasn't actually an accident. I was just lining myself up for the runway. So that is the basics of the G3000 system and the G Autopilot. Again, it's very similar to the G1000. There's not a lot of surprises there. The big thing that is great is that you have this little touchpad down here in order to enter data. It works great. I usually leave it on PFD mode or I leave it on NAVCOM mode if I need it, depending on what's going on. It all works very, very, very effectively. Watch out for this, by the way, because this is what you're going to be using to control the zoom of your PFD. If you're in MFD mode, this is going to be controlling the zoom of your MFD. So kind of watch out for that as well when you're landing. So uh, somebody in the last video asked uh, to go ahead and do a landing with this sucker. Unfortunately, we do not have anything fancy as far as ILS or anything along those lines. So we have to actually land the hard way, you know, like a pilot would. Let's go ahead and take a look at the window. All right, runway straight ahead on the right. That should be more than enough runway for us. Now, you're probably curious why I went down to Florida. Oh, look at that! The VAB. <laughs> it's about how big that is, too. And then, of course, your space shuttle takeoff would be all the day down on that end. And they're going to get very grumpy for me violating their airspace. So, flagrantly. But we're here, so let's go ahead and land the plane. I'm going to shut off the automatic pilot, reset my view, and let's get ready. So what are the quirks of landing a turboprop? Well, first thing you gotta really, really watch out for with a turboprop is the fact that the engine doesn't instantly respond to anything that you do. Because you have a gas turbine that's spinning in tens of thousands of RPM. So you have to get that thing to finally slow down before you're gonna be able to do anything with it. So in this case, I'm just gonna kill it and let the whole system slow down. And then I'll go ahead and get myself all stabilized once I get a little bit closer to the runway. Let's sit up a little higher, looks pretty good. I'm actually gonna lift my nose up just a teeny tiny bit. Gear down. It was over just a little bit. We actually have reverse thrust on this aircraft, which is really, really cool. Actually, I want to pull up just a little bit. We're just much too high, much too fast. Again, this is a very aerodynamic aircraft. Trying to get that nose up just a little bit. Trying to waste a little bit of energy so I can get those flaps all the way down. That looks good. Unfortunately, we do not have speed brakes on this one. There we go, as long as we keep our airspeed good. Now, do you notice this little thing that just appeared right here that's at 85 knots, this is app? That is our approach speed bug. That's the one we actually set in that little menu a minute ago. So theoretically, if we weren't in such a terrible position to try to land this plane, we could actually try to maintain that speed properly all the way down to the ground. But the reality is we're basically kind of cutting things short here. Now you're probably wondering, which one of the two systems do I like? This system is a lot faster to use. The G1000 is the only one that I've actually used in the real world. So it kind of changes things up just a little bit. Oh yeah, we've got plenty of energy to execute a really nice landing here. Kind of coasting in, we came in way too high. All right, nose up, watch the angle of attack indicator in the bottom left, it's gonna get very grumpy at me in a second. Ah, that was nice. Go ahead and flip on the reverse thrust. Of 
course, if I put reverse thrust on now, I'm never going to make it to the end of the runway because we're just going to have way, way too much energy. And go ahead and kill the reverse thrust. And we made it. All right, hopefully this video is helpful. Again, I'm just trying to look to kind of see the similarities of the two systems as well as how they work. This is a really, really solid aircraft, and it's great because it's fast, but you can still land on kind of normal runways with it as well. Other than that, enjoy, and uh, if you guys have any questions, throw them down in the comments. Otherwise, keep flying, and I'll let you know if there's any updates.